Hello, everyone. Welcome to Mining Now. I am your host, Jared Downey. Today on the show, we have GKM Consultants, and they are represented by their director of mining, Adam Dolmage. How are you, Adam? Good. How are you, Jared? Good. You, you warned me to not French up your name at the beginning of the show. So how did I do? You, you did well. You did well. I, I get GKM is a Quebec-based company, and my name does look a little bit French, but it's very much not French. So thanks for that. I was practicing the night before because I was going to nail it, and then you, you just took it away from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome to the show, Adam. We're going to cover a lot on the show. Um, I want to just give that quick snapshot of, of who GKM is. Um, and then um, and we're gonna, we got to talk about our sponsors. Gowdy is on the show. How are you today, Gowdy? I'm very good. Thank you. Um, yeah, we've got some sponsors to cover. Yes. But for the, So I'm going to do it just a quick thing, Adam. Um, can you just tell us who GKM is? Um, and then we're going to jump into the interview here um, after we talk about our sponsors. Sure, sure. So GKM Consultants, it's, it's really a company that's focused on uh, the customization and integration uh, and commissioning of geotechnical instrumentation projects. So geotechnical being, you know, any sort of uh, monitoring of, of ground, soil, uh, structures, structural health monitoring, any of those sorts of things. So we really focus on, um, you know, designing a program to monitor something for a client, whether it's in mining, uh, maybe infrastructure, dams, uh, you know, things like that. So we, we work across a number of industries and my focus is on the mining industry. It's, uh, I've got an outline here um, to follow because there's really specific um, projects that you've been involved in and partnerships that you have. So I'm, I'm quite excited to, to dig into them. Um, before we do that, Gowdy, who is sponsoring on Mining Now today? Well, we've got quite a few actually a few sponsors but before i get on with our sponsors um tell you sorry <laughs> reading and i have lost my place here um okay before we get started tell your company's story to thousands of mining professionals every week use mining interviews to communicate technical information and to demonstrate your company's leadership in the mining industry join as a company join as an expert ex sorry expert <laughs> be part of the crownsman and cim network Learn more about us at crownsman.com, or if you are a CIM member, reach out to their amazing team. Um, and so we are actually sponsored by CIM. CIM is the leading membership organization for technical content and creating connections in the mining industry. Mining professionals and students can access a breadth of technical expertise through the CIM Technical Paper Library, the One Mind Digital Repository, the CIM Journal, the CIM Magazine, and also attend upcoming CIM webinars. Whether you're working in the field, in the office, or at home, join the community today and learn how they can help you achieve your professional goals. You can find out more at cim.org. We are also sponsored by Bellatorum Resources. Bellatorum Resources is a veteran-owned and operated investment firm specializing in mineral rights acquisitions, leasing and right-of-way services, curative title work, as well as other consulting services. Their leadership team is highly experienced in providing all services associated with major projects in the energy industry. You can find out more about them at bellatorum.com. Of course, we are also sponsored by Savannah Equipment. Savannah Equipment supplies new and used mining equipment around the world from placer to underground to ore processing plants. They have gold concentrating tables, trommels, and mineral jigs in stock now to take advantage of the high gold prices. Go to SavannahEquipment.com to view their full inventory. Um, again, you can go to SavannahEquipment.com where you will find more equipment every day. And last but not least, we have Power Zone Equipment. When you need a specialized team of world-class engineers for your oil and gas pipelines, dewatering, or any fluid handling needs, you want to visit PowerZone.com. In addition to their inventory of rebuilt pumps, motors, engines, they also have an amazing team to design and engineer your systems, no matter the challenge, no matter the location. Get in the zone with Power Zone. Visit them at PowerZone.com. All right, those are our sponsors. Thank you, Gowdy. Okay, Adam, um, you, you gave that outline of who, who 
GKM is. And I want to jump into, uh, like, like I said on the top, into some of these partnerships. And I don't just mean partnerships in, uh, I mean within your team as well, because you, you've got a, a, a team together that, that puts out these projects. Um, but in the mining industry, we have, there's so much collaboration. So is there, when you're, when you're doing the projects, are you bringing together, are there multiple brands that you're, you're partnering with, um, even in an official way to, to sort of deliver the services? Yeah, definitely. So one of our main partnerships is with Geocon. So Geocon is a U.S.-based manufacturer of geotechnical instruments. Uh, we've, they've been with us since the beginning. And so they, anything that requires a, you know, a, a structural instrument, geotech instrument, typically that's our supplier for that product. Uh, but aside from them, we work with more than 20 different vendors and manufacturers. Uh, you know, anything from other sensor types that, that Geocon doesn't provide, very customized sensors like extensometers specific to mining, uh, data logging systems, whether they be wired or wireless, battery powered, uh, as well as software to, to bring it all together at the end of the at the end of the project. So quite a few different different ones, and you know, really, it's about the head of our R and D department is Dr. Vincent Laborn, and he's actually you know sort of pivotal in this whole process to vet all of these different vendors and manufacturers that we work with. So basically, if you know, he's on top of the latest trends and the latest technologies for our industry, and he'll go out and, and bring in samples, bring in demo kits from different manufacturers of these new products. He'll, you know, test them along with his team and sort of vet them to make sure that they fit into the, to the ecosystem that we bring and make sure that all the different manufacturers and all the different uh, products we're putting together work together you know as sort of a unified system because there's nothing worse than you know incompatibility between systems and sensors so that's really part of what we do and and we do that you know that's a continual process right we're always improving that uh, adding new sensors and and improving the portfolio that we offer and so what that gives what that does for gcam is it really is a powerful uh toolbox essentially that we have to bring to the industry or to, you know not just mining but like i said the other uh, the other industries that we work with like infrastructure and dams and tailings and all these other projects that we get involved in so it's really uh you know we're a good partner from that perspective almost i hate to use the word one-stop shop but it's sort of a a central point for any client to come to uh, and we have access to all these products. You, you mentioned, um, you sort of mentioned that review process and someone on your team actually facilitates that, but what, and I'm always curious on this type of thing because there is, I mean, there's a lot of, obviously in the sensor technology space, there's a lot of, um, everybody says their, their sensors the best and then they, they push it and there's, and which is fine. It's business, but what makes, uh, I mean, uh, the thing with with GKM is the projects you've worked on. You have to have good sensors, and we're going to get into those um, in, in shortly here. So, what makes a GeoCon? This is not like a paid ad for them or anything, but I'm I'm, I'm genuinely asking, what makes a, a something like GeoCon? What makes their product the reliable one that if you can use it, that's the one you go to? So Geocon's been around for, for more than 40 years, um, and they were sort of known as the pioneer of, <clears throat> excuse me, of vibrating wire sensors. So vibrating wire is a technology used for a lot of geotechnical sensors in the industry. It's, a, it's basically an industry standard when it comes to, you know, piezometers, pressure cells, and things like that. And they've really pioneered that technology, and, and they've kept up, up to date on it. And they've got quite a team down in uh, the United States, you know, working on this, doing all the manufacturing there and shipping worldwide. So, you know, when GKM started, it was basically Geocon and GKM, you know, partnered up to get, get going. And all the other vendors kind of fell into place after that. And, and where we differentiate from, because some people think we are Geocon. We're, we, we aren't Geocon, but we are very, uh, very tight with them. And it's really about all the other value, though, that we bring uh, and sort of that, I guess, agnostic approach to, to uh, the sensors. You know, we're not, because we have so many vendors and so many manufacturers to pull from, 
we can really customize a unique solution uh, for the client. And there, you know, sometimes there's a better fit. We might have one technology that's a really good, um, you know, long range wireless technology for surface, but that doesn't necessarily fit underground. So we need to have a different, a different tool in the, in the toolbox to solve that problem. So, you know, really gives us that, that power to, to do a lot with it. If you're just, you know, one manufacturer with one toolkit, you know, it's somewhat limiting uh, to what you can do for the client and really solve their problem. And for us, it's all about solving that problem for the client. You know, it's that it's really a customer focused business for sure. Do, do customers come um, uh, equipped with the knowledge about because you're putting it into a whole a whole service that you're providing? Do they come saying we want these specific sensors? Does that ever happen? Or when they come in, are they are they leaving it to you to do do that? Or is it is it a mixture? You know, it, it really is a mixture because you do have those you know highly technical clients. They they have a specific problem they want to monitor. Maybe it's uh, an underground excavation of some kind. They've they've had some cracking, maybe some high stress areas. So they want to put in some stress cells and they want to do a stress monitoring program. So in those cases, they might come to us directly. They really just need the sensors. Uh, maybe we'll go on site and install them, but maybe not. Maybe they have the expertise to do that. Um, in other cases, they come to us and say, you know, we're building a new tailings facility. Uh, obviously, uh, especially nowadays, tailings facilities are, are a big deal. Uh, after the issues with Mount Pauly and Brumadino, uh, there's a lot of focus on tailings dams and tailings storage facilities. So you know, in those cases, we'll often get involved with a consultant, um, you know, a, a geotechnical consultant who says, hey, we're building, you know, we're, we're assisting or we're designing a tailings facility for this particular company or mine. And, you know, we need all these types of sensors, but they need help maybe choosing the right type of sensor, maybe the right, you know, uh, rating of sensor, depending on the depth it's going to be installed or what exactly they're trying to monitor. And usually where the sensors is sort of one thing, and then there's the data acquisition side. So it's how are we gonna get the data from these sensors effectively? Because sometimes people, you know, they think the way to go is just go around and take a manual reading once a month or once a quarter, you know? And that's where we come in and say, well, you know, the cost or, or the ROI on manual readings versus an automated system you know, we can calculate that for you. We can work with you to sort of establish a, a budget, essentially, for how much that might cost to automate the whole system. And then you're not putting people into danger. Uh, you know, you're, you're keeping the people doing more important things like, you know, processing that data and uh, really understanding what it means rather than just out collecting it manually. Do you find, I mean, we've done, we've done a lot of shows talking about that very thing um and then recently with the tailings being such a high profile thing i mean it's almost like this uh it's turned into this under undertone um thing within the show um you know having companies like from brazil coming on the show and so do they does the our customers um are they more educated now because organizations like CIM having, you know, having seminars and, you know, all this information that's getting pushed out there, companies like yourself, do you find that companies, when they come to you, they, they have a clearer vision of what they want than even let's say they did five years ago? You know, they, they do have a, they've definitely improved. And obviously with all the focus on tailings, a lot has come to the forefront. There've been a lot of published papers, a lot of, you know, uh, conferences and so on that have occurred and a lot of evaluation of how these, you know, different tailing stamps have failed and the loss of life that goes with it. Um, so there's definitely a focus that monitoring is required. That's, there's no question. Um, it's, it's how to go about it. And, and that's where there's still a gap. And that's where we, that's where we shine really is to assist with that process so they know they need to monitor but exactly how are they going to monitor and what elements of you know the property the site uh, what are the conditions that need to be considered um, you know in order to monitor these sites and you know one example would be are you 
you know, are you in uh, sunny Nevada or are you up in uh, the Northern territories of, you know, Canada and stuff and, and where you're experiencing minus 40, sometimes minus 50 degrees Celsius for some months of the year, that has to be considered. Uh, the amount, you know, how large is the solar panel that may be required or do you need an extra, you know, protection around your logger to, to you know, uh, protect it from the elements, right? So these are all sort of, maybe they seem obvious to us, but it's not so obvious to some, uh, some clients. And, and that's where we really, you know, come in to help. And we'll work with the consultants who are doing the, the you know, the structural design or the geotechnical design of a tailing stamp, for example. Um, and, and we'll come in as the, you know, the instrumentation consultant, which is really, you know, what we do. The, um, you know, when I, when I start prepping for these shows, um, most of the, of the time it's within somewhat within my scope of knowledge. Um, and then, and then GKM that you threw a project at me that I was, it, it took me a few reads. I had to watch a video. Fortunately, you, you have this, this really good video that, that outlines it, but you did quite a unique, a unique project recently. Um, and I, I don't want, to, I want to get the name of it, um, right. But it was, uh, you were actually doing, I'm here, I'm just trying to find it here. You were actually doing like a, a replication of the, of the project, of the physical project. Can you talk a little bit about that one? Yeah, so, so what I might do, I'll just touch on a couple of other uh, projects. That, that one is a, a very unique one, and we, we do have a little video I think we'll, we'll play as part of this. But uh, I think I want to touch on sort of a typical scenario where and i've sort of talked about it but if you know one project we did uh was with agnico eagle uh metal bank mine and it was what we call our dl system um so on surface there were lots of different types of sensors hundreds of piezometers uh you know tdr cables inclinometers and we taught and thermistor strings was a, another big part of it up in frozen ground and you know, we did an evaluation of running this on a, you know, a battery powered wireless system. Uh, but the sheer number of sensors and the location of those sensors required us to uh, kind of take a step back and say, what else can we use here that's going to fit better and be more cost effective? And so we went with our what we call our DL system, which is based on a sort of a wired data logger and multiplexers that run into central locations. So that's an example of you know we did this evaluation we worked with the client and just based on the number of the sensors and the types of sensors and the site layout we had to choose that solution um you know the second one is really the uh bloom lake was another one that we did it was an iron ore project and that one was quite a few less sensors i think about 80 piezometers and the distance between these piezometers and the way that they were laid out um, made it really suitable for what we call our LS system, which is a completely battery powered system, no solar panels required and long range communication. So you've got, you know, a well with multiple piezometers in a well connected to one data logger and all these data loggers spread around the property are communicating back to one central gateway. And then that gateway ties in, you know, to a basically a web based data visualization software. And you know, a third project where we, again, evaluated is our Malartic, Canadian Malartic project. And that was actually a combination of both systems. Um, and this is unique because a lot of companies, you know, especially manufacturers, if you're working with them directly, they only have their own system. You know, they only have one system to choose from. Um, or they have some kind of an exclusive agreement with just one vendor. And and this is a case where there was no one, you know, one trick pony, as they say. So we were able to choose both the DL and the LS system, combine it together into one, ultimately one platform where the data comes into for the client. But in the field, it's a mixture of technologies and a mixture of sensors. Um, so that's really, you know, I guess the interesting thing with what we can do with our portfolio. And then as far as the project you know, that you mentioned, this is what we call the, the TRL project. It's Tyson, Redpath and Legcore. And it was monitoring a shaft sinking project. 
And the, the challenge there was that the, the shaft is so critical, okay, that when they pour the concrete liners in the shaft, that concrete, the strength of that concrete and the quality of that concrete is so critical that, uh, you know, they'll actually, if it doesn't meet spec, they'll, they'll rip it out and, and recast the liner. So the challenge was how do they, how can they test the, the uh, quality of that liner as it's cast in place? And we had been working with this company for a number of years already, I think since 2013, uh, providing shaft instrumentation, thermistors, extensometers, things like that to measure the structural integrity as they were building the mine. And when this particular challenge came up, you know, GKM accepted it. And uh, our very own Vincent LeBourne, you know, said, we think we can help you with this, you know, this project. So we get into these very custom situations and, you know, and really unique. Um, so what we ended up essentially doing is embedding thermistors all around the liner as they were casting this liner in place. Now, that in itself is maybe not that difficult. Uh, the thermistors themselves will measure the temperature curing, you know, as it's occurring in the concrete. But the question was, how do we get the data out of there, right? And what do we do with that data? So it was a matter of, you know, embedding these sensors, connecting them to these wireless data loggers. Um, in this case, it was the LS system. And completely battery powered, sending this, the signal from all these sensors up the shaft to gateways that were located on surface. And then those gateways are connected to their warehouse. Uh, the data is transferred there. And in the warehouse, they, we've actually customized these concrete curing uh, coolers, if you will. It's, it's much like a, uh, you know, just a, a beer cooler, <laughs> but a fancy one. And inside, they actually cast the cylinders. So as they're, the batch plant is pouring the concrete down into this, uh, these shaft liners, uh, we're taking that same batch of concrete, casting cylinders in this cooler on surface, and then the data from the thermistors is coming up live to these boxes, and we're actually matching the same conditions that the concrete is seeing underground. Okay, so we're actually controlling the temperature of this curing box and simulating that same, that same environment. Okay, and that was really the unique thing that we did there was to actually automate that whole process because the issue was after they cast this liner how do they get back down to get the cylinders because this is typically what you know what happens in a mine they, they cast some backfill or, or they you know do some backfill in the mine and they cast cylinders and then someone goes down at you know seven days 14 days 21 days or 28 days and they grab the cylinders and then they crack the cylinders and test the strength um, but the issue was getting, it was the access to get back down to these areas to do it. So by simulating that whole process on surface, uh, you know, it, it, it was this sort of revolutionary thing that allowed them to, to test those cylinders, you know, on surface instead. So that whole project right, really from end to end was, was custom designed, uh, you know, by GKM in conjunction with the, these contractors working on this project. It was, um, and you've got a nice video, and uh, um, Gaudi will have to see how your timing is. We'll try to splice that video into the, uh, into the, um, well, well, Adam was walking us through it. There'll be no problem. <laughs> the, oh, yeah. the, the, the narrator of the video, he has a really nice voice, I just have to say. You were already trying to take my job before the show got started. It, it, it might be, it might be my own voice, I'm just saying. <laughs> um yeah, no, I've been on a few of those videos where I'm presenting a video that's my voice, but I tried to—I always try to change it up a little bit, so maybe people can't tell. <laughs> I was something when you walk through because you've sort of outlined four projects there, and um, I—I'm—I'm uh, I'm not an expert in your field, so I have to do my best to try to relate it to something in in my own in my own world so that I can sort of understand it. Um. I'm not a sound engineer, but we have to do a lot of sound engineering. If you look here, there's wires running all over the place and all that sort of thing. So someone who doesn't understand it or understands it even less than us, 
would have a very tough time putting this set up. I mean, they may be able to hold up a phone or do whatever, but the actual production through mixers and all that stuff is difficult. Now, when you get to a higher level, you know, full TV production where there's, I mean, it's just they're on site and they're switching live and different camera angles and zooming in and zooming out. I don't even get how they do it. When you come into these projects, is the system that's in place is approaching it from sort of an engineering uh, standpoint. Are the systems in place or is it building it from the ground up? And I know it's sort of a tricky question, but when you walk onto a site and they are saying that what their problem is, is it, are you, do you know the solution within a day or are we talking weeks of trying, like on a major project like that, how long does it take? to decide what the most efficient, because you have all these different technology that exists, just like in our production, but how you put it all together is really where the mastery comes in. How hard is it to do a project like the one you just, you know, with this uh, modeling and all, all that sort of thing? So I think, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that because there's, sometimes there's an expectation from the client that, uh, you know, you, you're gonna get a, an RFP uh, from a company and you would just have to respond to this RFP. But there, there's a challenge there because we, in those cases, and that does happen where we just get an RFP that says we need a hundred sensors and, and a data logging system. And there's no context, you know. So you have to go back and you're often going, you know, through procurement, um, which isn't, sometimes can be difficult because really, what we need to do is talk to the geotech engineer or the rock mechanics engineer or the tailings engineer and really understand the pain points. What are you trying to solve, right? And, and we do get involved at that level quite often. And, and it's usually with a consultant, you know, because they're the ones advising the tailings engineer. So then they come to us and say, how do we, you know, how do we solve this problem? And we work together. And in some cases, you know, we help develop the actual RFP that goes out uh, to tender, which can sometimes <laughs> work to our advantage and sometimes it doesn't because we've done all this work and then, you know, sometimes we don't get the project. Right. Um, in this case, it was more of a, it was such a custom solution that, you know, the, the client basically hired us to help them with it. So it wasn't like we were just trying to sell something and we were doing some free consulting. It was, hey, let's engineer a solution together. Um, so, and it does take, you know, weeks or, or months, the, the bits and pieces that are obvious come together quickly, you know, okay, you need, you need some thermistors, you need some, uh, we're going to use our wireless system to get up the shaft. Okay. That part, no big deal. Um, how do you actually pull the trigger on that though, and make it, you know, uh, actually, you know, put this project together. That's where the, the nitty gritty details come into play. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and so how do we, okay, now we've got the data to the gateway. Now, how do we get it to the warehouse? Okay. It's going to be through maybe fiber or some kind of ethernet connection. Okay. We've got the data there. Now we need to take that data. We need to do something with it to control this box. And there was a lot of technical details there, you know, programming a PLC that would control this curing box and, you know, maintaining that. And it all had to happen very quickly, right? The, the sensors actually have to be installed uh, and the data acquisition system installed essentially, you know, live in situ and connectivity to this curing box has to happen within about two hours. That was the requirement. So well, putting in the, in the cement, right? Yeah. And, and, and we're actually, you know, this is the case where we have uh, eight people that are rotating in and out of this site and have been for, for some months now. Um, and so our people are on site, we're installing those instruments, we're installing the data acquisition system, and we're getting all that connectivity set up to that curing box. So we're really, really actively involved. Um, not every situation is like that. I mean, that's really where our value comes in when we have our field personnel on site uh, doing the installation, you know, ensuring that the installation of the sensors is done correctly. Uh, ensuring that the systems are connected properly, that they're designed, you know, fit for purpose. Um, and then obviously connecting it into software, which we also provide that 
and, and your reports are set up and your thresholds are set accordingly. Um, you know, that that's really, we can provide that end to end sort of solution. Um, but we don't, you know, it, it's not always a, a big project. You know, we, we do lots of very small projects where maybe they just need a, a few piezometers to measure some water levels or pore pressure. And so we'll sell them a few piezometers and no one, you know, we don't go to site and install them. They just do it themselves. Yeah, but when they set up a system and hand it off to them, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that happens. I mean, you know, we went through uh, a few months ago, obviously with the, with what's going on in the world, uh, there was a bit of a slowdown where some of our field jobs, um, you know, were postponed or, or temporarily, temporarily canceled. So we had to adapt to that a little bit. Um, there were some scenarios where we couldn't get people to site. So we were doing, you know, some more phone support or even zoom calls like this, uh, going through, you know, a hardware box. This is how you wire it in. This is how you, uh, you know, set this up. So like everyone, uh, you know, we've adapted to, to the way, uh, things are going. So. Will some of that stay now, have you learned some of those systems that you can do it efficiently and in 2021 or 2022, whenever things get back to some version of a new normal, um, someone's going to cut out that new normal clip and think I'm supporting something. <laughs> Not, I'm just, <laughs> um, when it, when it, so to some, when we get back to some semblance of, of that, of, of on site, is it going to carry over? Do you think, um, are some of these new systems in place that you can, uh, even more efficiently, you know, provide a service? You know, it's funny because there's, there's lots of buzzwords in the, in the industry, right? Plug and play and, and IOT and IOT wasn't good enough. So they said IIOT. So we've got, you know, we just keep adding these acronyms. I -I um, IIOT, industrial internet of things, right? So there's, there's so many buzzwords and, but, but really when it comes down to it, sure, there are, you know, we'll call them plug and play systems but there's there's always these little intricate details that come into play and and again that's really where our value comes out you know we have like our values as a company are you know expertise diversity uh you know teamwork and respect and these are really what what drives gkm and the uh the fact that people want to install plug and play systems, there's those little, those little things come and, and they're super important, right? Yeah. How you, how you protect the cable or how you protect the enclosure or just again, you know, fit for purpose, making sure you're choosing just the, <clears throat> excuse me, just the right thing. If you're putting in a sensor, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, if you're putting in a sensor in a borehole, um, the borehole is probably more expensive than the sensor in a lot of cases. Okay. Like the cost of mobilizing a drill and, you know, drilling that hole and the crew and everything that goes with it, it's expensive, especially in an underground mine. And so if they're going to put a sensor into a hole, you want to make sure that's done properly. You want to make sure of all these things, the grout mix, you know, is set, is done properly that, it's fully encapsulated in the borehole that it's bonded well, whether it's a, an extensometer or a piezometer or any other type of, you know, sort of geotechnical measurement type of device. Um, and if you don't have that experience and people look at the manual and they say, Oh, this is, this is easy. Yeah. What are they, you know, what are they saving? And I think that's really what it comes down to. I've seen so many projects fail, uh, you know, where people try to do it themselves without you know because trying to save a few bucks um and and it just it's it's not it's not worth it in most cases like i said the borehole costs more so yeah, spend I'm, a little I'm, bit more to bring the expertise in and make sure that you're you're really knocking it out of the park and you're going to get value out of what you're doing yeah no adam i'm i'm really glad it's it's actually something that um we've sort of almost touched on on the show but we haven't really and if we have, it's been a long time. And, I, I, and I'll use that production example again. We can go out and spend five, six thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars on camera equipment. Where, where the actual, uh, and sometimes it's even more by the time you're done. It's all the cables, the adapters, the different softwares running it, making sure those softwares sync together. I mean, just adapters alone in our system 
is this huge network of things to make it all come into one hub. And, you know, and you see, and, and that's just, a, you're working with, I mean, if, if we don't run, we just, <laughs> we just don't play for the day. In your case, there's people's lives at stake. They're, they're going into these systems. Um, you know, there's millions of dollars worth of equipment in place. And it really is, it's, it's seeing those, these things. And I, I, I'm probably guilty of it on the show, seeing a system and going, oh, that's, not, that's actually pretty simple and straightforward. <laughs> Don't go on site and try to do it. And I wanted to actually touch on something too. You mentioned some of these smaller projects. Is there an example of just a small project? Um, because of course, so many different levels of companies watch this show. And I, and I want to touch on just to make it clear that the small operators can also get value and they should get value from companies like yours. Is, is there sort of a project that you can kind of highlight that sort of as is an example of that? Yeah, absolutely. So one, one project that we do frequently for a lot of, uh, of different mining companies is backfill monitoring. So, you know, and this is sort of come, this has come out of some research at a few different universities and, you know, some consultants have done some, some, you know, research into this. And this has really driven some of this uh, business that we have now, but it's, it's, you know, paste or, or any kind of backfill monitoring. So, you know, typically in an underground mine, they build a barricade and then they pour a plug and then they do a pour to surface to fill a stope. Um, now, you know, if you're not monitoring, if you don't have any sensors there at all, you're, you're sort of going in blind. Uh, maybe the backfill barricade itself is, is well engineered, but you don't really know unless you're, unless you're measuring, you know? So what we do is put in, you know, piezometers and, uh, pressure cells, uh, total earth pressure cells, and they're actually mounted on the barricade so that as they pour the fill in there, the pressure is measured, uh, on that barricade. So you can actually see that, you know, essentially live if you want, um, now there's cases where we, again, you know, it's a small project, maybe just four or five sensors. Uh, maybe they're manually read even. Uh, we have some that just show a pressure gauge, like a manual dial pressure gauge on the outside. And, you know, the shift boss goes up, you know, every hour and he takes a look at the gauge to make sure it doesn't go above a certain pressure. That's a very basic way where maybe we've just provided the instruments. Again, they've just purchased some geocon pressure cells and piezometers and they manually read them. Uh, the next level would be installing a data logger of some kind. Um, and maybe they go and they download the data from the data logger after they've finished pouring. And that, that would be sort of a very basic setup. So they're not getting live feedback, but they are able to go back and sort of post process that data and see what the pressures got to, uh, if they were safe, that sort of thing. Um, then the next level would be automating that. So actually taking that data logger and either cabling it back to, to ethernet or wirelessly transmitting it back over a mesh network, uh, for example, and bringing that data, you know, to the control room where the person running the backfill program can actually see in real time, those pressures building up and, and they can make real time decisions, uh, with that, right. You can, you can stop the pour and say, hey, the pressures are, are getting to an unsafe level. Um, that's an option. Or you can do a continuous pour, right? I mean, that's really the, the holy grail is to be able to do a continuous pour right to the top of the stope without stopping because you're not having to you know, flush the lines and let the, the plug set up for a few days and then pour the next, plug, the next level and the next level. They do it in lifts typically, and it's for safety reasons. But if you can monitor, and you know that your pressures are not hitting a, an unsafe level, you can keep pouring until you're finished. And that increases their cycle times. They're able to get back underground faster. Uh, you know, it's obviously safer that they're monitoring it in real time. So that's, you know, it may seem like a complicated project, but that's a very simple project. It's a few sensors, small companies, and we get a lot of regular orders for, for doing backfill monitoring underground. That's a, a good part of our business in mining. Is that an affordable, in the scope of the project, doing a system like that, is that an affordable thing for most, for most companies? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're talking, you know, uh, 
a, a, a couple thousand bucks. Like <laughs> it's We're not talking half a million dollars. And no, no. Thing. And I, I, I know a lot of people watching the show might have a better idea than me. I just, I was just curious in a smaller scale. It's, it's not in the scheme of things. It's not a huge expense that they need to put out or put into their books. No, I mean, a, you know, a piezometer is 500 bucks, you know, four or 500 bucks. And a pressure cell is a couple hundred more than that. It's, it's not a, the sensors themselves are not extremely expensive. Like I said, the cost of that barricade, let alone the cost of a failure of a barricade. I mean, we, we don't even have to talk about that. Um, the same with the, you know, you look at a tailings facility, right? I mean, what's the cost? Uh, it's, it's just unfathomable, right? You just can't. You can't even realize it until it happens. And then you go back and you look at all the work done and all the, the studies and the engineering, you know, again, talking about Mount Pauli and Brumadino, look at the, you know, some of the costs involved in that and the life, the loss of life. I mean, it's just, but, you know, I, I never like to use scare tactics. I mean, it's not really the, the best way to go, but it is kind of one of those conversations where you say, okay, you're going to spend, you know, Maybe it's a hundred thousand dollars, a couple hundred, on a on the, you know, reasonable tailings uh, monitoring program, depending on what you're looking at. Yeah, it's it, you know, I guess I mean scare tactics. It's it's I mean the industry talks about data so much. Well, we now that's that is data. I mean now we we can see real examples. Like I said, we've had companies from Brazil, Brazil on talking. I mean it's it's a very real thing that needs to be needs to be assessed. And, and it sort of leads me to a sort of a closing topic, um, Adam, for me that I wanted to, I wanted to go over because this show also has a, a leadership element to it. And I always try to pull out sort of a different thing, a, a different point. And of course, of course, it makes GCAM look good as well. But, but there's, there's companies watching that are trying to get in, into an industry, maybe not in your stream, but in something else, um, new companies, young companies. And a lot of these projects, and you and I have talked offline, these major projects that you're doing, it started with the small projects, like the one you just highlighted. And I want you to talk a little bit about how important it is to build up that relation. I mean, and when those bids come available that you get, you know, you get to be at the front of the line because you've been proven on these smaller projects. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point. It's very very unique or, or almost, you know, just infrequent that we would get a giant project right out of the gate. You know, you, you always start small in, in any of these projects. Um, you start out with a few sensors here, a few sensors there. And, you know, that's, uh, you, you build that relationship. So again, maybe the first thing is just to sell a few sensors and no on-site services, no sort of consulting work, and that's it. The client knew what they wanted. But then the next time they say, hey, you know what? I, I like those sensors worked out for me well the last time. I need something else, but now I've got a different problem I need to solve. Um, can you help me solve that problem? So then we get a little bit more involved, maybe a little bit of engineering on the front line there uh, to figure out a solution. And, you know, then, okay, hey, you know what, guys, you did such a great job that time. We need you to come on site and actually help us install this system. And it just grows from there. And really that's, you know, the, the shaft monitoring project I mentioned. It, it started off, you know, instrumenting a few levels, pretty basic system, <clears throat> and it just grew, right? So now, like I said, we've got a number of staff that are just, just on rotation there, two weeks in, two weeks out uh, on site. And, and of course, it just strengthens that whole relationship as well. And it keep, continues from there. So, you know, these, <clears throat> and, and we're always looking for, you know, as far as projects like that, we're always looking for new talent, A plus, you know, people to add to the team too. Um, and despite what's going on in the world, we've been growing uh, quite a bit actually. And uh, I haven't been with GCAM all that long, but we've hired a number of people and there's a lot of things, uh, you know, constantly going on with, uh, with our projects and, and evolving. You won't, and that's, you know, you said, you know, you're, you're growing in these times and you're, you're seeing that there's some companies that are growing and, um, and just to sort of hammer the point home, it's, uh, you know, people have, <laughs> it, it's like you coming on a show like ours. Yes. Thousands of people will watch it and that's fine. But at the end of the day, 
people are making decisions based on the team, your capabilities, how you deal with them, all that stuff. It does come down to all those old fashioned values of competency and professionalism. Um, you might get through the door because someone saw you somewhere, but you'll just get through the door. That That's as far as you go. How do you sort of, I, I don't want to put you on the spot too much, but those initial meetings that you have, is there, is there sort of a mindset that you go into? Because there's so many different personalities in this industry. I mean, there really is. Um, and, and you've got to walk in there. You're, everybody knows somebody's selling something. Everybody's trying to make a living. And that we're all fine with that. But how do you go in there just sort of mentally when that new client and you're going to, you want to build a relationship that's going to be 10 years and you're going to do major projects with them. But that's just that you're through the door. What's your sort of mindset when you go in and start the communication with a company like this? You know, it's the, the older you get, the, I guess the more comfortable you get with these situations as well. I mean, if I go back to the beginning of my career, you know, 16 years ago or so, I'd have a very different answer. But at this point, you know, I'm certainly confident in our abilities at GKM for one. If I didn't have such a solid team behind me uh, to be able to roll in and do a presentation and and have the confidence that we could actually make it happen, uh, you know, I just wouldn't be able to do it, right? So that that's that's huge. I mean, teamwork, and you know, one thing I need to point out too is that the way we're structured at GKM, it really is a collaborative approach. And I've been with companies where you know, people have targets and they've got individual, you know, uh, targets to hit and things like that. And there's almost a competition between people on the same team. Right. And, and that's not always healthy because you're, you're literally fighting your, your colleagues. Um, there's nothing like that at GKM. It's really a unified front. Uh, and that's reassuring. So, so knowing that going into a meeting, that I've got this team of experts, you know, PhDs and masters and, and engineers and all this field experience and all this instrumentation experience, right? And, and not only that, but if there's anything that maybe we don't, haven't already done, we go and, and we talk to our partners, right? We talk to our, the, the vendors and the manufacturers that we're partnered with and they come in and assist us because they want to see us succeed as well. Um, so it really presents this sort of, you know, there's, there's almost no problem we can't solve as a team. Um, and there's a lot of just, you know, confidence that comes with that. So, so when I go and I talk to these companies and I do a presentation or, or you know, uh, explain what we can do, that's just, it's like, you know, even though they may not physically be there with me, it's that whole uh, just team feeling that you've got going into it, which is, uh, you know, not every company is like that. And, and that's something I've realized. And it's a, it's a really important part of how we work at GKM. Yeah, I was when you when you were giving that answer, which is which is a great answer. I was thinking, um, I would have loved to have see your answer 15 years ago. <laughs> and what that would be and, and how different it would be. Do you what if you were to if you were to try, what do you think your answer would be? What would what would have been your mindset? Um, 10, 15 years ago, going into a big company and you're going to present this, this service that you can provide. Um, do, do you, do you remember some of those initial ones and how it sort of, you, you sort of grew out of that? Jared, 15 years ago, I would have been never let on a computer to even do this interview. So <laughs> it, it, it's a non-starter. <laughs> it's a non-starter. My boss would have said, there's no way we're putting that guy on camera. He just started. Um, no, it's, it's, you know, it's amazing uh, <laughs> how we all, you know, adapt and, and grow over the years. And, and to be honest, I mean, in my twenties, I was, I was learning, I was, you know, way more arrogant probably than I should have been. And, and you, you figure this stuff out as you go, you make mistakes. I mean, I made lots of mistakes and, um, and that's something if I was to give any advice to young people, I mean, be humble, but also, you know, express your opinion. Because you need to be shot down. You need to, to, uh, to get a bit of a reality check. And you learn from that. And you grow. And, uh, you know, now I'm, I'm with a great company and, uh, you know, very happy with, with what I'm doing and what we're doing collectively as a team. 
And there's such a good feeling in that. And, you know, I've seen so many companies with, you know, again, the stuff happening in the world that, that made some, I'm going to say mistakes, right? I mean, they, they lost people and, and people quit or they got fired. And, um, you know, we've really made some good, good moves uh, at GKM and, and, you know, kept the ship sailing, right? So uh, the leadership, you know, there's, uh, it's just exceptional. So, uh, so that's, it, it, it's nice. And I can't say more about just the, the values that we have and the teamwork and everything that goes with it. And there's no pointing fingers. It's like, okay, someone made a mistake, but let's, let's grow together and, uh, and really figure out how to solve these problems. So it's yeah. just, you know, it, it's, uh, it's good the way that we're set up for that. Yeah. It's, you know, you talk, and I want to wrap up with, um, you know, the interview, but, um, it's, uh, you, you said something that I, I really do, do think is there is so much information out there. Um, and there's a sort of this idea to listen, 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 which is very important. Of course you need to listen, but, um, I, I know for me and I, I, I'm, young in the mining industry but now when i go to events i start to see me the version of me five six years ago you know the you know the kid with a backpack on you know that kind of thing you know in a university or whatnot and it's like i i actually enjoy the the, the, the young people that i see speak up that they have an opinion they have some thoughts and they and you go oh yeah that that is a good idea and then this company tried it over here and the reason it didn't work and it starts a dialogue when you just meet someone who just all they want to do is listen and don't really want to throw out even crazy ideas. It, it actually lands pretty flat. So I, I'm always thinking when I hear this advice to young people, just listen, 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 which is good because some people do need it. But it's like, no, you got to you got to throw out your ideas. I mean, that's how you're going to make something in this industry. Yeah, and I think that's that's a key point that you want to make sure you're part of a company that listens to you. Right. So, so not only do you as a, you know, a, a young person, a young, uh, you know, person in the work, entering the workforce has to, you have to listen, but the company you're working for needs to listen because <clears throat> it's a two way street. And, uh, and I think that uh, Stephen Covey, I don't know if you've read uh, the seven habits of highly effective people, but I, I was, I'm going to say I was forced to read it in school, but I've read it a few more times since because it really is, uh, a good book and I, I'm not gonna lie I don't remember all the seven habits right now but the the one that that sticks out to me is uh, listen with the intent to understand and then be understood and that's really you know that one resonates with me uh, I should probably use it more in my personal life with my wife but you know um, I'm learning there as well now we're, now we're getting into some real interesting topics <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like we're out of time, uh, Jared. <laughs> no, but I think uh, that's a key. That's a key one, right? So you really want to be, don't be the the guy in the meeting that that you know is is just uh, flapping gums, right? And and spewing out nothing. Think about what you're going to say and say something intelligent, right? It's much more valuable than the quantity of words you say. It's about the quality. Um, so I think. You know, again, you got to make these mistakes when you're young and you learn from it, but don't, you know, you got to get back up and you got to keep going. And then you hit a point in your career where you kind of have it figured out. You know, everybody's always learning uh, and getting better at what they do. But I mean, I started off as a, as a technician. I was just in the field, wiring boxes and, you know, hooking up sensors. And, you know, now I... Uh, you know, I'm mostly sales and, and business development and uh, management and stuff like that. So it takes time and, and you gotta, you gotta figure it out and you gotta know what you want. Yeah. It's uh, the nice thing for us doing this show is, you know, um, we, we get to talk to like people like yourself who are able to actually outline this stuff. Adam, th thanks for, thanks for being on the show. Um, you know, and, and going through, you know, leading up to the show, preparing it. And, you know, a lot of people don't see that part of it. You know, the, the effort the guests put in, I, I just recently did a post about it, um, is that it does take time to prep these shows and outline it. So thanks for, you know, being patient with us as we put it all together. And, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it and got to cover some of the topics you wanted to today. Yeah, no, it was great. And I appreciate all the work you guys have done on the other end and the CIM and mining now, the whole thing is, uh, it's a really interesting experience. So good, good for you guys as well.
Yeah, and on the CIM note, I'm very happy there. Uh, you know, like anybody, they they've got they got their live events taken away from them, like you know, and so they're adapting, and they've got some exciting stuff coming um, in in 2021. So it, it's good that we're all sort of still talking and communicating and, and moving forward. And and I'm I'm very it's very good to see stories like GKM who they're you know they're not just maintaining; they're actually growing in these times. That's very encouraging for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, everybody, for watching the show. Thank you, Adam, uh, for joining us. Um, I, I thought, Gaudi, I thought we were going to get into some really personal stuff there with Adam, and then pulled back on us. <laughs> that'll be that'll be the next interview. We'll just go. We'll go straight into it. Part two. Um, thank you, Gaudi. Where can everybody follow us? Um, like us, comment. Nobody's being very negative lately. I've been looking for a little bit of little bite from people where can people go to give their true opinion <laughs> oh, I should, uh, turn, up turn your on mic. my mic um <laughs> uh yeah you can contact us if you'd like to be a guest on the show um or would like to recommend someone that should be a guest on the show um info at crownsman.com is the place um to contact us you can also follow us on facebook and linkedin at crownsman p please go ahead and subscribe to our youtube channel there's an episode on there. Actually, there's like two to three episodes a week. Um, so definitely check that out. You can listen to us um, wherever you get your podcasts, whether it's, you know, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We're pretty much everywhere. So yes, you can, you know, listen to us everywhere. Watch us, listen to us, you know, all that wonderfulness. Yeah. And comment. Yes, you can also comment on there. So, <laughs> Jared uh, wants to know how he can be better. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, we will see you on the next episode of Mining Now.